Well, good afternoon and warm welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Melgott and I'm the head of department of mathematics here at University of Sussex. Today, the Department of Mathematics is launching the Dr. Perry James Brown Research Center on Mathematics and its Applications. The startup funding for the center comes from a very generous private donation by Jim Brown, who passed away too early in 2017. As it says in his will, James' intention was to foster excellence in mathematics. In a few minutes, his uh, lifelong friend, Jules Atsopati, will tell you more about Jim, his life, and why he decided to make a donation to mathematics as a subject and specifically to the department at Sussex. After Jules' speech, the chair of our research committee, Professor Enrico Scales, will introduce the speaker at the very first James Perry Brown Sussex Mathematic Colloquium and it's a real honor to, to welcome Phil's medalist, Professor Alessio Figali from ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. We all very much look forward to his talk entitled A Walk Through Optimal Transport and Its Applications. Before introducing Jules, I wish to say a few words about the purpose of the research center. Uh, the main goals will be to promote excellence in mathematical research at Sussex by firstly, giving mathematicians in the Department of Mathematics at Sussex the freedom of research needed to achieve important and useful results. Second, fostering collaboration um, of mathematicians at Sussex with national and international mathematicians. And third, fostering interdisciplinary collaborations with applied scientists, both within the University of Sussex, but also elsewhere. As a general principle, the center will support the full spectrum of active research directions and will seek to enable both small and large research groups. With these introductory remarks, I invite Jules Atsopati to tell us more about his friend, Jim. Thank you. Can everyone, can everyone hear me all right? Right. Um, me. Honourable Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor, um, Professor Alessio Figali, uh, our distinguished guest, and Professor Michael Melgard, on behalf of the family and friends of Perry James Brown, or Jim, as he um, let himself be called in the later days of his life, let me express a deep sense of appreciation to the university for the honor and privilege of <clears throat> naming and creating this department in his name. I also would like to thank Dr. Marina uh, Pedrera Villarino who worked behind the scenes. She knew um, Perry uh, also and all those who contributed to make this uh, day possible. And as uh, Professor Melgard has just indicated, he, Perry's stated intention was for the purpose of fostering excellence in mathematics. But I think his legacy is underpinned by an unspoken truth, namely that there is genius in every one of us, a fact that he walked in his life. But Perry wasn't so much a mathematician. His passion was for flying aeroplanes. He studied um, <clears throat> uh, civil engineering at uh, Leeds University and flew with the Air Cadet Squadron and wanted to be a flyer, but the airlines would not train him because uh, at the age of 10, while on holiday in Addis Ababa, he suffered a kidney, uh, uh, some kidney damage and Therefore, it was left to him to fund his own flying training, keeping his day job as a civil engineering, flying evenings and weekends. And when he found spare time, he'd pick up um, his books and do uh, um, <clears throat> some part-time study in mathematics. I, can I say with 
may have some apology at his mass teacher uh, referred to him as a moron. Um, but he went on to get two mass degrees at undergraduate level, one with distinction, uh, both first class and one with honors, and then went on to do his D Phil. Uh, but he was very much a normal person and wanted to live a normal life. So it called me to have lunch, which meant uh, dropping down to Shoreham Airport or, uh, or Biggin Hill would fly out to the Channel Islands of France for lunch and get back uh, the same day. Um, he, he was very much uh, one for living life to the adventure. We, I, we were in primary school together in Aden, which was then a British colony. And in our teenage years in Aden, um, in 1964, Aden was perhaps best described as the single most dangerous place in the world outside a war zone. And um, <clears throat> certain areas of Aden were designated strictly out of bounds, which meant out of bounds to everyone but Perry and I. We would go there frequently. People who went into those areas rarely came out alive but uh, we both seem to have lived to tell a tale. Um, I can't say very much about his mathematics. Uh, if you ask me to explain uh, Bayesian theorem, stochastic geometrical probability, or um, <clears throat> uh, vector analysis, uh, you'd have to give me a PhD in talking a lot of nonsense. But um, as I understand it, his uh, mathematics worked on the basis of hindsight. That is to say, it, he, there was no mathematics, as he explained, that could predict and correct every possible error that could arise. And he was referring to a wide range of things from aeroplanes, rockets, and even stock market shares. But by hindsight, hindsight, he would be a be able to work back and therefore he seemed to have created a mathematics where he would apply hindsight in advance. Please don't ask me how, uh, but it seemed to work and he developed a stock market formula and he had a portfolio which worked quite well and I was also able to uh, sell his portfolio as part of um, the uh, estate. Uh, exercise. And sadly, I have that program still with him, but I'm grateful to Professor Melgard, who has agreed to see if he can get a team in his department as a project to try and uncover his mathematics, which would um, certainly be a good thing to see that this part of his song um, not die with him. Um, and I think that the final thing I could say is that perhaps uh, one part of his legacy would be in the, the achievement of everyone who can take advantage of what we have created today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jules. I will um, uh, introduce Alex Figali. My name is Enrico Scalas. I hope you can hear me. And um, so Alessio Figalli um, uh, is a very well-known mathematician, but uh, perhaps uh, his CV is not universally known. So he received his PhD uh, in mathematics uh, in 2007 from Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa and Ecole Normale Superiore de Lyon uh, with a thesis on optimal transportation and action minimizing measures and his supervisors at the time were Luigi Ambrosio uh, and Cédric Villani. Uh, then uh, he moved uh, to work as a chargé de recherche du CNRS at the University of Nice in, in France. Uh, later, he uh, joined uh, as professor, actually Professor Adama, uh, uh, the École Polytechnique de Palazzo in France. And uh, uh, this was between 2007 and 2009. And then in 2009, uh, 
uh, he moved as associate professor at the University of Texas in Austin, where he went on progressing his career, um, uh, becoming then full professor in 2013, in 2011, and later um, Moore chair, always at the uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, later in 2016, uh, so more recently, he uh, became professor at uh, uh, the Polytechnical School of Zurich, ETH, uh, and he is also uh, has been since September 2019 uh, the director of the Research Institute for Mathematics uh, in German Forschungsinstitut für Mathematik in uh, Zurich. Um, without um, Swiss pronunciation, but yeah, I, just, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry for this joke. And uh, uh, last but not least, he received the Fields Medal in 2018, and the motivation was for contributions to the theory of optimal transport and its application in partial differential equations, metric geometry, and probability. Uh, he received uh, several honors, prizes, and awards. Among uh, them, I would like to mention that he is a foreign member of the Royal Spanish, the Spanish Ac Academy of Sciences. He has been a uh, member of uh, the Academy uh, since 2018. And uh, in 2018, he also received a knighthood, a knighthood uh, of the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic. Uh, and um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Alessio uh, uh, Figalli, and uh, um, I would like to uh, uh, set the policy for questions. Uh, so because of uh, the large number of people, um, I am collecting questions in the chat. I will send also a, a message. And so if you have a question, type it in the chat and uh, I will report it to Alessio. Uh, and uh, we will have also a short question session at the end of Alessio's presentation. So uh, that's it from me, Alessio, please. Okay, so thank you very much, Enrico, for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me to this event. It's uh great pleasure and honor to inaugurate this series, actually. And um, I'm particularly happy also that uh, this happens in the University of Sussex, where I have also, you know, friendship and, uh, let's say, scientific, friend, friendly and scientific uh, you know, connections. Um, I actually remember last time I was there was just a bit before receiving the Fields Medal, probably one month before there was a conference uh, at the Department of Mathematics. Uh, in Brighton. Um, so, you know, for many reasons, I'm really, really happy to be here today. Unfortunately, I would have liked to be there in person, but, you know, COVID is not helping us on that, but that's still nice. So um, I will now share my screen with my presentation. Um, uh, one moment, sorry. Uh, okay. Please, I hope it worked yes so okay so um as the title says i would like to do a kind of walk to alternative transport and its applications um i will make the presentation kind of um a mixture in the sense that on the one hand i want to give an overview of alternative transport and also applications uh some closer to my research some more um maybe farther from my research, but I think still very interesting. Um, also, you know, it's, um, I think it should be a broad colloquium. So in a sense, I wanted it to be accessible to everyone, but it's still a mathematics colloquium. I thought, I thought some formulas have to appear. So there will be just a few formulas appearing here and there, but, you know, nothing uh, too extreme uh, at all, actually. So let me start from the very beginning. Optimal transport, what is that? So optimal transport uh, has a very long history and it started with Monge. Gaspar Monge, uh, we are uh, during the French Revolution, then Napoleonic period. Um, so the goal was to extract a certain amount of material from the ground and transport it in places where, where you could build constructions out of that. And um, 
um, the goal is to do that in the cheapest possible way. So in order to minimize uh, the total cost. So the idea is that if I want to move material from one place to another, um, you know, there is a cost. It could be work workforce, it could be money, money wise. You want to minimize that. Um, so when Monch modeled that, this was mostly, as I said, during the Napoleonic campaign. So it was for military applications. Uh, the idea that Monch had was that the cost should be proportional to the travel distance. So the number of kilometers you want to move the material, that's how much you should, you should pay. Um, it, Monch made several contributions to the problem, but um, the, you know, this was studied by him, but then it kind of disappeared, this problem from the target of the, of the researchers for many, many years. So from Monch, we have to jump 150 years to Kantorovic. A question from the audience. Uh, they cannot see full screen, but I don't know if it is a feature that your presentation allows, but uh, in case... Ah, you, uh, full screen, let's see. Uh, let's see if this works better. In this way, does it work? Thank you very much. It's okay? It is okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Sorry, because uh, I'm never sure uh, with technology. Uh, so then Kantorovic came. So 1940s, um, Kantorovic uh, introduced a, a more, uh, let's say, mathematically more robust formulation of the problem. He made it what we call it a non-deterministic problem. What do I mean by that? In the, so for Monch, the idea was that if I have material in allocation X, I can move this material in a location Y, but let's say for each X, there was a unique Y mathematically. So each look, the amount of the material in one location could only go in some other location, unique. But uh, let's say if I'm having mind economics, let's say location X represents a bakery and location Y represents a coffee shop, is not uh, normal. I mean, it's not, uh, won't be a good model if I'm obliged, if, one bakery can only supply, let's say, bread to a single coffee shop. So I should have a model which allows me to say, okay, perhaps I have a bakery that sends bread, bread to three different coffee shops. On the other end, maybe a single coffee shop can buy bread for multiple bakeries. So then it, it's a matter of kind of drawing arrows and deciding for each arrow how much bread you transport from one bakery to a coffee shop. And then the goal, what is the goal? The goal is to minimize the total transportation cost. So this is an economical problem, which is very much in the spirit you know, of, uh, of Russia in 1940. So communist period, right? Where you're looking at the wealth of the total population. You're not trying to make a bakery richer or a coffee shop richer. It's just that the price is the same. So there is no uh, you know, competition. It's just that you want to do this in the most efficient way. And your goal is just to minimize uh, the cost of transporting bread. That's it. Given, fix the production and fix the, the, the demand. So Kantorovich developed a very robust mathematical model uh, that allowed him to kind of make the problem tractable and receive the Nobel Prize in economics for his work. Uh, of course, you know, if you have 10 bakeries, 50 bakeries and 30 coffee shops, the problem is not then so complicated, but mathematically, if you want a theory which is robust, as the number of bakeries and coffee shop gets larger and larger, that's where you need, you know, a robust theory. And uh, perhaps for for this particular application, this is not so relevant. But I will give you an example later where the number of data is more of the number of millions rather than the number of, you know, uh, hundreds. And therefore, it's important to have a good, robust theory. Um, so, um, just to check, the slide switched, right? So, did it move the slide? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, because one time I had a problem with switching slides. Okay, good. So, um, then, so Mantorovich, we had in the 1940s, now in the 1980s, modern mathematics kick in, in the sense that mathematicians really started to want to work on this problem. Some important works have been have done by Brenier and Rachel Ruschendorfs. And, um, and let's say the mathematical problem is this. You have a cost, C of X, Y, that represents the cost of transporting a particle from X to Y. And you want to transport the material, like in the picture, from left to right, in order to minimize the total transportation cost. And uh, 
for a mathematician, the first question you want to ask is, does an optimal transport exist? This is very natural. Are we talking about something that really exists? Or are we talking about something that perhaps doesn't even exist? Uh, of course, again, if you have only finitely many data, like as before, a certain number of bakeries and coffee shops, there is always an optimal choice because you only have finitely many possibilities. Therefore, you can show that there is an optimal way. But as if you, it's important mathematically sometimes to make the data, the number of data growing more and more and more until infinite to have a, to allow for infinitely many data in some sense, uh, like a defin defining a continuous distribution, and and then the existence of optimal transport is not so clear anymore. And also, one, assuming it exists under suitable condition of the cost, perhaps, um, can we understand how it looks like? So these are by now well understood, these questions. So I will not enter into that, but let me say, let me just make a comment. The choice of the cost plays an important role. So for Monge, the cost was the distance, modulus of X minus Y, really. You take two points and you measure the distance. For most applications, actually, it turns out that a, an important cost is the kinetic energy one half x minus y square. So this is like reminds of one half b square. Um, this uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, I don't have any, uh, let's say a reason to justify this, just it works better. Uh, you know, physically kinetic energy make, makes very much sense. Um, mathematically, it's very convenient. Um, but it's important to think, for instance, in application that perhaps, you know, if I want to transport material from a city to another city, I cannot just measure the kilometers. I should also take into account the geography of the space. Perhaps there is a valley, there is a lake, there is a river in between. So the cost cannot be just a mere number measuring the kilometers. It should, of course, take care of the geography. So by now, mathematicians have well understood how to embed everything inside the cost. So the cost can kind of, um, take care in itself, in, the, in its formulas of the geography. So it can be defined according to the geography of the space. And then it's by now is also understood uh, how to solve it. So this will not be the topic of my talk. I just want to tell you this first part of the theory, which is probably the first thing you need to do when you have such a mathematical problem has been taken care. Uh, as I said, this is a mathematical colloquium. So let me just give you three formulas to be a bit more rigorous what I'm talking about. Um, if some of you are not familiar with some notation or something, don't worry too much. In three slides, this will be gone. I will just repeat essentially what I just said, just more mathematically. So what are we transporting mathematically? So mathematically, you, you, you say you represent the, the distribution you want to transport. The, you see the image on the left and the distribution you want to attain, the, the castle on the right, has two probability densities in let's say in the Euclidean space RM. And then you say that this is a transport map if uh, the change of variable formula that I wrote in the slides holds. So every time you integrate a function against G is the same as integrating the same function composed with T against F. Um, this is just a mathematical way to make rigorous the notion of the fact that T is transporting the mass of F into G. And it's uh, also, an not difficult to prove that if T is smooth, so you can compute derivatives and it's you know a diffeomorphism, so it's uh, invertible and injective, uh, then um, you have actually a diff a, a, an equation for a transport map. So the form, the integral condition that I wrote above with this integral of phi G equal integral of phi composed with T with F uh, can actually be written as a condition on the determinant of the gradient of T, which depends on F and G, okay? So there is also a differential way to write the transport condition. And so what is the optimal transport problem? The optimal transport problem, so you consider CXY the cost, and then you want to minimize the total transportation cost. So you see C of X, T of X is the cost of transporting one particle from location X to location T of X. And then you, you integrate this against f of x dx, which is the total mass you want to transport. And this is the total transportation cost. So the goal is minimize this quantity among all possible transport maps. Um, these are not simple, not, not trivial problem. And I would like just to state a theorem by Jan Vrenier, 1991. So if the cost is the quadratic cost, so x minus y squared, 
then the transport map is unique. So it exists and is unique. And also it has some structure. The optimal transport map is the gradient of a convex function. Um, so this is like a, a, a this has been a very important theorem, and I will show you an application of this theorem. The only thing you need to remember out of all this discussion is the corollary. So the corollary of all this optimal transport comment is the fact that given two probability densities in a RAN, there exists a convex function phi whose gradient, gradient phi, which is a map from a RAN to a RAN, transport f to g. So um, notice that the corollary doesn't have any optimal transport in it. So it's a sense, uh, optimal transport is just a way to construct this map. But the corollary is just an existing theorem that tells you that you can always transport one probability density to another probability density via the gradient of a convex function. How you prove the corollary? Well, you solve the optimal transport problem with the, with the quadratic cost, and then you apply Brignier theorem. But it's not important for us. So the important is just this existence result that I will use it later. Um, OK. There is a question. Yes. Um, how come it took until 1991 to obtain this result? Well, uh, the problem is that this, so, uh, okay, it depends uh, how familiar one is with, uh, you know, calculus of variation problems. But if you look at this formulation, so you want to find uh, among all the optimal transform maps, one which minimizes this integral. So you have this integral, integral of C of X, T of X against F, and your constraint, no matter you write it, it's this one. So it's either this change of variable formula that I wrote on top or a Jacobian equation. So what is very difficult is to prove that, to prove that the minimizer exists. And actually uh, there is no obvious way if you think of methods in the calculus of variation, which are usually, you know, you, have a, you want to find a minimum, you take a sequence of transport maps which are better and better. So you take a minimizing sequence, which, so a transport maps which are almost optimal, and you would like to prove that you can extract a limit which would be optimal. This step, there is no standard theory to do that. So um, Brenier um, kind of understood the right way via convex analysis. So it's a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, a posteriori, the proof is not even that complicated, but uh, a posteriori via convex analysis, he found a way to uh, uh, you know, attack the problem in, in a different perspective. I think no one thought about it. Um, let me also say that you know, um, this problem was studied by Kantorov, which, which was mostly, so he was a mathematician, but he had mostly mind economics. And uh, also we are talking about optimization problems. So convex optimization problems. So it was also out of the radar of, let's say, many analysts or people in, in any work in analysis in the calculus variation for many years. So I think the two things together played a role. So the, let's say, no standard structure of the problem, but also the fact that for many years it was really out of the radar. Um, and, uh, but once Bernier got this, not, the problem became important, not only, and we'll see in a second, not only because the problem is beautiful by itself. Okay, that's a personal opinion. But uh, because it has applications that go really beyond the optimal transport theory. Okay. Um, so let me just tell you in uh, one slide, I mean, I will put everything. So optimal transport actually has application to many, many things. Meteorology, urban planning, engineering design, biology, image processing, machine learning, many, many things. Um, these are discoveries of the last 20, 25 years. So it's not that it wasn't born as a problem that had application in these areas. I will discuss some of them. Um, but just to tell you how ubiquitous it is by now. Now, it was mentioned that uh, I personally got the field medal also for the optimal transport theory. So I always somewhat, you know, after 2018, uh, many people like when I, meet uh, high school students, uh, university students, uh, journalists, they ask, okay, what did you do? And uh, it's nice that at the same time I got the medal, there was a uh, Leo Ortolani who, uh, uh, who draws comics, 
who was preparing a comic uh, edition for about Scuola Normale. So he thought of inserting also myself in that edition. And he also explained what I did. So this way I don't have to explain anymore because he explained that for me. So that's the explanation of why I got the medal. So I was awarded for that. I was awarded this medal for my contribution to hotel transport, which is the cheapest way to move masses from one place to another. And you see myself getting caught without ticket on the public transportation, uh, which, you know, it can be the cheapest way as long as they don't catch you. Then once you have to pay the ticket, it doesn't work anymore. But of, I was caught after the Hills medal, so that's fine. I mean, then I already got it and it was too late. So that was my solution of the hotel transport problem. Um, now, uh, this was one probably, but there is more than that. So it was not only for this. And the goal now is to present you something else, some other application. Uh, so let me start with a story, a legend. These are always nice. Le the, the legend of Didos. Didos was a, a, you know, a, a queen, of, actually her, husband, her uh, brother was a king of, uh, of Tyre. The, 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 so Didos' brother murdered Didos' husband, as always happens in this kind of mythology. And then she had to fled to escape with the, her servants. And so Dido sailed across the Mediterranean and she led in the realm of King Yarbas. And from this king, she asked for a piece of land where uh, she could live with her servants. So she offered a certain amount of money for a piece of land and uh, uh, King Yarbas accepted the deal. And he said that for that amount of money, she will give her as much land as she could enclose inside a single oxide. So essentially, she, there was a you know uh, the, the the skin of a bull uh, that uh, and she and essentially the the the, the king said okay the, the the amount of uh, land you can enclose with such a skin that's gonna be your your city. So Dido accepted the deal, and then she. She take the skin and she cut it into very thin strips. And then once she got all these strips of this skin, she sewed them together to make a very, very long cord. And then once she had the cord, the, quest, the, the deal was very clear. She could get as much land as she could enclose with this cord. So then she had to choose which shape should she, should she give to such a cord in order to enclose as much land as possible, because then whatever was inside the cord would have been the place where she could build their city. So this becomes now a mathematical problem. I give you a cord, let's say 10 kilometers long, which shape should I give to this cord in order to enclose as much air as possible? Uh, she was a smart woman, not only for sewing the cord together, but also to, for choosing the shape. She made a semicircle against the coast. And this is where she found the city of Carthage. So this mythology, this uh, legend is the beginning of what mathematicians call the isoperimetric problem. So let me tell you, what is the isoperimetric problem? It is given a curve of a certain length, enclose as much area as possible. And uh, you see that if you're on the coast, the best thing you can do is to draw a semicircle along the coast. If you are inside in the interland, the best thing to do is to draw a circle. This will give you the, the largest amount of area for a fixed length. And it's not coincident that many cities actually have this, this kind of uh, shape, right? I mean, many cities are circulars because you always want to minimize. I mean, you want to have as much area as possible, but you want to have as little, let's say, uh, boundary or perimeter as possible because that's from where people can, other uh, people can attack you. So you want to have uh, as little land, as little perimeter to defend as possible. So naturally you want to draw something, either a circle or a semicircle, depending where you are. Now, so the problem can be stated in two ways, as I uh, noted in this, um, uh, as I noted here in this slide. So either you fix the length of the curve and you maximize the area, or you can fix the area and minimize the length. It's the same problem, just formulate it in two different ways. 
And why did I like to formulate in this way, in the second way? Because in the second way, it's natural to look to tell you what is the solution in three dimension. So what I drew here in this slide is the two dimensional problem. But what happens in three dimension? In three dimension, you're gonna have a, an object, a solid object. You are gonna fix the amount of volume of this object. And then you want to minimize the surface area of this object as little as possible. So um, how can this be done? Well, as kids, uh, most of us probably played with soap bubbles. And what happens when you play with soap bubbles? You have a soap film and you start to blow air inside the film. Then when the bubble detaches from the wire, the, this plastic wire, the ring, the bubble closes itself. And then the amount of air inside the bubble is fixed. It cannot go in, it cannot go out. And then what happens is that the surface instead can still move the, the shape. And there's gonna be the tension of the soap film, which will act as a force and will try to change the shape in order to minimize the total surface tension. But minimizing the total surface tension is the same as minimizing area actually. Therefore, the soap bubbles, as we all know, are round. So the problem in three dimension is, is, the, is uh, what I just said, and the answer is given to us by soap bubbles. Of course, you know, this is not very mathematical uh, answer. So let me just discuss a moment how you prove this mathematically. So I will maybe do it a bit quickly, but this is just the only second part where there is math, and then we'll go on without formulas. So mathematically, the superimetric inequality is an inequality that tells me that the perimeter of an object controls the volume, and the only objects that minimize the, that uh, satisfy equality here are balls. So it means that once you fix the volume, if you want to minimize the perimeter, you have to be a ball. And this is this formula embeds everything. Now, how do you prove this formula? The way to prove this formula is the following. You have your set on the left, E, here in the picture, and you have your ball, which is your candidate optimizer. And then what you do is that you transport the uniform density inside E to the uniform density inside B1. So the optimal transport gives you a tool to transport probability densities. How you build probability density out of sets? Just make constant density inside a set. And then what happens is that if you transport the constant density inside E to the constant density inside B1, you can do this by optimal transport theory. And Brené theorem tells me that I can do this with the gradient of a convex function. Okay, what are the properties then of this map? I have three properties. Property one, uh, oops. property one, modulus of T is less or equal than one. This is because T maps E to the ball of your radius one, so by definition, all points in the image have modulus less or equal than one. Second condition, I have a determinant condition for gradient of T. And this is what I told you uh, before. If the, being a transform maps can be written as a condition on the determinant of grad T. And in this particular case, when the density is F or G are constant, that's what you get. And then condition three tells you that the divergence and the determinant have a relation. And I will prove this in the next slide. But if you accept one, two, and three, then you prove the superimetric inequality you see just in the bottom of the slide. Because you start from the perimeter, the perimeter by definition is the integral on the boundary of one. Then you use property one to substitute the modulus of T. Then you know that the modulus of T is greater or equal than the scalar product between T and the unit normal. Then you can apply Stokes theorem to make the integral on the boundary and integral inside with the divergence. Then you apply property three to replace the divergence with determinant, and then you apply property two to write down what is the determinant and you get what you want. So perhaps I've been a bit fast, just, but I just wanted to show you how optimal transport can play a role in something completely different as a parametric inequalities. Uh, what is property three? How do you prove that? It's actually nice because um, Oops, sorry. Um, so since T is the gradient of a convex function, the divergence of T is the Laplacian. So it's the sum of the eigenvalues. And then if you write the sum of the eigenvalues 
of the Hessian as n times one over n times the sum, you recognize an arithmetic mean of numbers, which is with non-negative numbers actually, because phi is convex, uh, which is gonna be large, greater or equal than the geometric mean. And that's it. So the, the relation with the divergence and determinant is just arithmetic mean greater or equal than geometric mean. So that's the that's the proof. This proof is due to Knote originally, the idea of the proof, uh, 1950s, and then Gromov rediscovered that in the 1980s. Um, so now let me make a comment. Oops, I'm, okay. So uh, in the first uh, at the end of the 19th century and then beginning of the 20th, first Gibbs and then Wolf understood them that the same principle which governs the shape of soap bubbles is, is also governs the shape of crystals. So soap bubbles are round. Why? Because they minimize the, surf, uh, the surface energy. In the same way, crystals have a certain shape, some crystalline structure, because they also minimize some surface energy, just not the same surface energy as the one of bubbles. The surface energy of a crystal depends on the molecular structure of the crystal. But the principle here is that, um, you know, mathematically is the same thing. You are, there is a isoperimetric inequality behind the crystal sense of bubbles. And the minimizers can be characterized mathematically. And this governs, the, in some sense, these kind of shapes. So just to say the crystal sense of bubbles are governed by the same principle. And mathematically, you can study them using similar formulas. But then if you start from these considerations, you ask yourself the following question. What happens if you add some energy to the system? What does it mean? You know, the, the saying that the soap bubble is round is an idealization. Why? Because the soap bubble will always be subject to some forces. There will be gravity, wind, something. Same way crystals will be subject to some energy, perhaps the temperature in the room or any other force, gravity as, as well, which will slightly deform them from the ideal perfect configuration. And then you would like to mathematically find a relation that tells you how much the shape of this object can change given the amount of energies you administer to the system. You have to think that this amount of energy is always very, very small. I mean, it's not, you're not breaking the object. I mean, the soap bubble still looks almost round. Uh, but you would like to have a mathematical relation between the energy and shape. So this is the question we asked ourselves. In fact, this has been asked for many, many years. I will just draw it uh, an idealized situation, like think that the idealized crystal is a pentagon, and then you give a certain amount of energy to the crystal, perhaps by raising the temperature. So the temperature increases, and then the crystal starts to deform until it gets a bit wiggly, perhaps. Uh, and you ask yourself, okay, given epsilon, can I say how much the shape changed? Um, so we can think here of optimal transport as a way to understand this heating process. So optimal transport can help you answering this question because in some sense it can capture this movement of particles in the, heat, in the heating process. And then you can try to use optimal transport to answer, to answer this question. Um, so this is what we did in 2010 with Maggi and Fratelli, we proved that if epsilon is the amount of energy, the shape can change at most by square root epsilon. And this is optimal. Mathematically, I will just write the theorem. This is the informal one. So if epsilon represents the error in the superimetric inequality, so here I put some formulas with subscript k. So k here in this formula is the analog of the ball for a crystal. Okay, so just think that for a crystal, there is a certain K which plays the role of a ball. PK is the energy of a crystal, and you have an analogous inequality. And epsilon tells you how much you are off from the minimizer, so how much energy I gave to you. And then you can show a bound of what's called the symmetric difference. Again, if you know what it is, it's great. If you don't know what it is, it is not so important. I hope that at least the informal discussion I gave, it's clear. Essentially, the two objects don't differ by much. They differ most by square root epsilon. Um, this was actually a result that we were very happy about it. And it's kind of universal. It applies to crystals. It applies to soap bubbles. But if you think about crystals by itself, it's not very satisfactory because I never saw in my life a crystal which is so wiggly as the one I drew in my picture. 
a crystal perhaps can be deformed a bit by the energy, but usually, you know, it's kind of a rigid object. It's not easy to move the, the, the sides and make it so weakly. And in fact, the theorem that we proved with Zhang in 2020 is that the crystalline structure cannot change. What does it mean? It means that even if you give an energy to the system, you see that if you start from a pentagon, you remain a pentagon. The sides can move a bit, but you're a pentagon. The same way in higher dimension, let's say in the three dimension, if you started with a cube, you remain a parallelopiped with sides parallel to the one of the cube. So it's actually a very rigid phenomenon. Although you have infinitely many degrees of freedom in your minimization problem, in reality, physically, you will never observe them. You will always see something almost similar to what you, what is the ideal one. Um, okay, this was just one application. Now, another application that I like to mention, and very briefly, so this is a PDE, which is linked to meteorology. And uh, I wrote it on the slides, not because I wanted to read it, but because I, I hope you will be as scared as most mathematicians are when they read it, because it's a complete mess, this equation. It's very difficult. There are many, many variables, many unknowns. But what's the principle here? I'm not going to discuss this, this equation. I will discuss this picture. Suppose that I give you two clouds, one a certain instant of time, and one cloud one millisecond later. Clouds are made of many particles, billion of, billion, billion of particles, okay? And then you, you drew them, you draw them. So these dots that I draw are the particles of waters. Uh, I can only draw a few of them, not a, not a billion. Um, and then I ask you, just by looking at these two pictures, can you say who, goes, who went where? So just by looking at these two pictures, can you tell me each particles from the left to the right, how it moved? That doesn't sound an obvious problem because I have a lot of particles. This is a kind of a global movement. But what Mike Cullen, a meteorology in UK, uh, understood in the 1990s was that there is an optimal transport behind it. So if you can solve the optimal transport problem from, from the left to the right, so you minimize the total transportation cost, you will have your coloring scheme telling you exactly how each particle moved. Of course, the problem is that you have many optimal transport because for each millisecond, in some sense, you have to keep taking pictures of your clouds. And then for each millisecond, you have to solve an optimal transport problem. And actually, you cannot do every millisecond. You should do every one over a billion seconds. And you do it a billion times to see the movement. So in fact, you're solving, and then in the limit, you're going to solve infinitely many optimal transport problems from each picture to the, the one immediately after. Um, but OK, this was already a big discovery. And in fact, people tried for many years to use this intuition to solve uh, this equation that I showed you. So there is an intuition. Optimal transport is behind this equation that is, I wrote on the, on the screen here. How do you see in this equation of optimal transport? Sorry, question about the, the um, cost in this optimal transport problem. So what is the cost? Yeah, the cost here is quadratic cost. So for both problem, the crystals and here, you use x minus y square. So it's again Brenier theorem. So that's. There, uh, is there, a sorry? there is also another technical question. Is this somehow related to the Benamou Brenier relation of optimal transport? Uh, I would say in this case, actually, uh, no. No, uh, it's a good question, but no, in this case, it's really specific to this equation. It looks very much like a fluid formulation, but no, it comes uh, really from a static uh, formulation of the transport. So, um, no. Uh, and, uh, and, but let me, there was anyhow, so, uh, uh, yeah, actually, Callan works arrived before Benamou Brenier, which is, I think, is 2000. Um, and uh, so the difficulty to go from this intuition of Callan to the PDE was we needed some results on OTL transport, in particular to what's called the motion per equation. I will not enter into that, but just to tell you that to make the connection, we needed still something in the theory that was missing. That's something we, we did with uh, Guido de Filippis in 2013. 
So thanks to that, that we could then solve the semi-geostrophic system in a series of work with also Ambrosio and Colombo. Um, so the only thing I want to give as a message here is actually um, uh, how you, you solve a problem. So in my mind, you know, I want to prove a theorem is like reaching the top of a mountain. You want to climb the mountain, you want to get to the top. Um, and you don't know how to do that. Maybe you may, you may never be able to get to the top. I mean, that happens to me most of the time. But let's say I want to get to the top. There may be many paths to get to the top. It means that we have many ideas, many possible strategies to solve a problem, but we don't know which one is the correct one. And so what you do sometimes, you try something, you get stuck, and then you have to choose. Either you keep pushing, and this can help you perhaps to go a bit further, or at some moment you get so stuck that you have also accepted perhaps your, the strategy you were thinking about doesn't work. And then you have to go back, forget everything you have done, and start from scratch again with a different idea, different strategy. And this is similar to go to climb a mountain. Maybe you get stuck along a path and there is no way to go to the top from there. You have to climb down and start again. And that's what sometimes works. So this problem took me seven years. So I, I, I think of that as a, 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 you know, a good example of this kind of climbing phenomenon. Uh, and this is a, in this case, I was lucky to have a positive outcome, but many times as I say, perhaps there is no positive outcome and we get stuck for many more, much more than seven years. Okay, so this was my second personal example. Uh, very briefly, let me conclude with some more concrete applications. So uh, one thing you can do with alternative transport is color transfer. Just look at the last row. You have an image, this image of this lady. Then you have a second image, the, the one to the right, which is kind of a style image from which you want to extract colors. And then you want to take the colors from the second image and put them in the first one. How do you do that? Well, each Im image has a, to each image corresponds a certain histogram of colors. So you can, in, the, in the set of histogram of colors, you can represent the intensity of each color, right? So you can think of having colors in an image as a kind of uh, distribution of colors and with you know higher intensity lower intensity and then what you can do from the out once you extracted the colors from the image you can do an optimal transport from one histogram to the other histogram okay and uh, um, essentially so you're transporting colors okay and what you, once you do that in an optimal way you get you can get this image in the third in the third uh, column first uh, last row that then with some filtering you can clean up also so this is a way so optimal transport provides you a way to transfer color from one either to, from one image to another uh, same way on the first row right and uh, I think it's uh, these two are the most uh, the one where you see better this phenomenon. So optimal transport can be used for that. In general, can be used to trans to move uh, objects to compare pictures, for instance. So when you have pictures, you have billions of pixels. So that's why I told you at the beginning, it's important to be able to transport with a lot of data, with the number of points being huge, millions. Uh, there are millions of pixels, right? So a lot of points. So that's one application. Another application is to, uh, is when you work with uh, random matrices. So these are, these kind of matrices appear, for instance, in neural networks. So neural networks are very fashionable now in artificial intelligence. They kind of tend to mimic what how our brain works. And perhaps you have to put weights to tell you how much two neurons are connected to each other. And then these weights, Sometimes you have to find them probabilistically and random matrices play an important role here. And uh, what we did with ISPONA in 2016 was to use optimal transport to transport, let's say, properties from a one random matrix to another. So uh, again, it's uh, a problem which a priori there is no optimal transport in it, but the moment you understand that you can transport anything you want, in fact, you can also transport uh, uh, properties from one large matrix to another large matrix. This is what we did. And now to uh, conclude, let me mention another example, the one of uh, GANs, 
where um, you have, let's say, two neural networks, so like two computers. One computer, the generator, is creating fake images, let's say fake images of cats. Then there are real images on the top. And then you start to send these images to the discriminator. And uh, the goal of the discriminator is to receive these images. And then uh, once it gets the image, essentially what the discriminator does is to choose to say whether they are real or fake. Now, the discriminator can be right or wrong. Whenever the discriminator is right, means that the generator was not good enough. And then we have to tell to the generator that it was not good enough, it should improve itself. Vice versa, if the discriminator is wrong, it means that the discriminator will improve itself by learning that it has been wrong. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of game that they play between each other. And they, by playing the game, they get better and better, both of them. One to generate and the other one to discriminate. And what is optimal transport here? Well, the question is how you measure images from being close to, how do you measure whether an image is, clo is close to a real one or not? Optimal transport provides you a tool to measure the distance between images, again, because you can transport pixels. And this is what gives rise to the what's called the Wasserstein gun. So I will not enter into that, but Wasserstein gun is a model where you really use optimal transport to, uh, to decide whether an image is real or fake. This is just take that. And, but if you want to apply optimal transport in all this problem, you have to be able to solve optimal transport numerically in an efficient way, okay? And uh, to do that in an efficient way, it means that if the number of points is capital N that I want to transport, I need to do it, let's say, not, with a cost, computational cost, which is not too large in N. And, uh, um, so if you use standard algorithms back even to Kantorovich, this would be like n cube. On the other end, it has been recently discovered that you can do it with almost n. You have to you don't really solve the optimal transport problem. You have to solve an entropic, a uh, regularized problem. But the moment you accept a small regularization parameter, you can do it with n to almost to the power one. And um, this has been a big, big improvement of uh, Kuturi first and then Kuturi and Pere together that really now makes, you know, computation of transport much more efficient. Um, I think this is not the end of it. There are still, there's still a lot of work in all these directions, but just to say that, you know, this is also a very hot topic. So I stop here. Um, I thought of, uh, you know, concluding with this picture of the Brighton Pier, we worked in front of that last time I was in Brighton. And actually, I remember going there as a kid with my parents, uh, I think 1992. And uh, I spent many evenings playing inside the Brighton Pier. So I have good fond memories of that. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Alessio. So there is a um, final question, in fact, uh, and uh, before we conclude, uh, there is a question about um, extensions of Brenier, uh, Brenier theorem. So uh, what happens when the supports of the densities are uh, non-convex? And is there a hope to have a non-elliptic mont jean -Pierre? Okay, so wait, uh, let's see. So Brenier theorem has nothing to do with the support of the density being convex or non-convex. Brenier theorem it tells me that Given two probability densities, there exists an optimal transport map, is unique, and it's the gradient of a convex function. And that's, that's always true. Now, if the target density is convex, you can use some kind of regularity theory for motion pair, so to, to say that the transport map is kind of smooth. So if you have assumption the support of the density, you can prove properties of the transport map via the motion pair equation. Uh, if it's not convex, Things are more tricky. Still, you can use motion pair to prove something, but it's known that there are singularities. This continuity of the transform map. Um, now, a non elliptic motion pair, uh, it exists. I mean, you can have the hyperbolic motion pair, but that's is, uh, which, you know, it's uh, like determinant of the Hessian equal minus one. That's hyperbolic. Um, 
it's related that is not related to optimal transport anymore. You are trans I mean you will have negative signs, so it's like transporting negative densities. It has nothing to do with optimal transport. You're doing something more in the in the spirit of prescribing a negative scalar curvature or something. So it's it's a different problem more in the um, hyperbolic geometry, I would say. So yeah, that's my answer. Thank you very much. So I will now try and ask people to unmute. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, the talk is over. Uh, thank you really very much uh, to all of you for participating, for asking uh, several questions. And I hope you enjoyed uh, this seminar by Professor Figalli and uh, you uh, got interested in optimal transport and uh, uh, maybe in its applications uh, uh, to uh, your fields uh, and uh, exporting maybe results there, etc. Uh, thank you and see you maybe at the next uh, event of this period, which will be probably in uh, autumn uh, winter. Bye bye. Thanks bye -bye. for organizers. Thank you. Thank you very much.